I think its biggest disadvantage could be when people are maybe forced into a sale for a whole host of reasons. What is your experience with the 1031? What's been your biggest frustration with the 1031? So the 1031, you do kind of get put in a time crunch where you have you you have to identify the property. So sometimes, sometimes uh, I think its biggest disadvantage could be when people are maybe forced into a sale for a whole host of reasons, and they didn't plan on selling it, or they didn't necessarily want to sell it, but they have to for again some random reason, and they're just unable to find a good property to do that like kind of exchange into. Yeah, you never want to be a motivated buyer. Yeah, <laughs> the worst place to be. Man, oh man. Okay, cool. So uh, we were talking before the show, and you mentioned uh, DST. What what were you talking about? So with the deferred sales trust, I mean these these two strategies, they they rhyme in a lot of ways. They they have a lot of certain characteristics. Obviously, with the deferred sales trust, you get a bit more liquidity. You get more flexibility in terms of the investments that it's going in there. Um, it, it you it makes sense when you have that more active approach. There are certain people out of there that just don't want to be that involved. They, for whatever reason, they got a huge return on some asset and they are just looking to park the money somewhere. They're just looking to invest it for the future, but they don't have any interest in uh, being a real active participant in that. And they just want somebody else to handle it for them. And, and this is for the, this is for that type of individual. So, um, how do, how do deferred sales trust not to be confused with a Delaware statutory trust, everybody. So we'll, <clears throat> that's a 1031 into, um, a read, but how do you, can you use these opportunity zones, right? And deferred sales trust together. Yeah, you could be able to. So you can set these up to be owned because these are really owned in a non-qualified brokerage account. I mean, they're owned in a very simplified investment um, holding. It's it's nothing fancy on that end. So as long as the trust is able to hold it, it would work. Yeah. So that's interesting. So I need to dive more into how the opportunity zone would fit in with the with the deferred sales trust strategy, because that's one of the beautiful things about the DST is you don't have these time horizons that you have to deal with and you yeah. get all of your money up front. So like in an opportunity zone, like fund, right? Are you earning that 9% that is it, are you able to take distributions with that? Or does that have to just compound back into the fund? So you're locked up for at least four years. Okay. First time in, and then there's quarterly liquidity events moving forward after that. Okay. Ideally, ideally, this is a long-term hold. This gotcha. is money that you really don't plan on using. I think another cool thing about it too is since it's in real estate, real estate is notoriously very uh, tax-friendly. You mm -hmm. get a lot of tax benefits. Yeah. And so the fund will actually pass through tax credits. So if the fund generates income and spits off dividends that you take, it can offset those or it can pass through it can pass through tax credits and offset other passive income streams you have, whether that's crypto mining, rental real estate, anything that's considered passive income can, make, can be offset by the funds passed through tax credits. That's super interesting.